The Women's March spanned both Saturday and Sunday across cities throughout the U.S., with many calling it one of the largest protests in recent U.S. history. But with the massive presence of people taking to the streets, it can leave many still to question what does protesting actually accomplish. The history of protesting in order to participate in the most practical form of democracy has been with the U.S. before its inception, and it still remains a bedrock as it's written into our Constitution. The abolitionist movement helped bring attention to the harsh reality of slavery and helped its overthrow through the Civil War. Worker rights activists like Mother Jones took to the streets to get children out of the factories and strengthen working conditions. The socialist, communist, anarchists, and everyday workers who, after years of toil, protesting, taking to the street, and shutting down factories, finally got a voice and saw the passage of the eight-hour day, the right to form a union, and better working conditions for everyday workers. Women protested in the 20s to get the right to vote, and later in the 60s and 70s to receive abortion rights, fair compensation, more involvement in management, and to declare some sort of independence from a patriarchal system. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, Rosa Parks, and others from the civil rights stopped bus rides, remained seated at counters, to acknowledge and eventually break down the corrupt and racist laws of the South, and to become citizens with the protected right to vote. Cesar Chavez and farmers protested along Central California in order to get better representation of the agricultural workers since they were left out of the New Deal. They went on protesting, upsetting the agricultural community and creating better working environments for the workers. The LGBTQ community stood up at Stonewall, marched through the streets to demand funding for research against the AIDS epidemic, called to action for the civil rights to be respected against the discriminatory bills. They successfully saw the legalization of gay marriage in 2013. We could easily search through history and point out moments where a collective action of people taking to the streets, speaking out publicly, have enacted change, moved leaders to implement a more democratic response, and forced governments to listen to the public. But in the last couple decades, protests seem to have lost their importance. When people protest today, the public seems lost on what is being asked, or in some cases sees it nothing more than inconvenience. At the turn of the century, the last two big protests that we saw were in 1999 and in 2003 which were the WTO protests in Seattle and the anti-war protests against the invasion of Iraq in 2003, being one of the world's largest protests. In 1999, the protests did have an impact delaying talks on a trade deal that would have benefited the wealthy corporations at the public's expense. And nearly 16 years into the war in Iraq, people's opinion of the war have changed. The lies of the WMDs and the extent of the war going beyond anyone's expectation have come to the surface. This example alone can leave many wonder, how is protesting beneficial? With the anti-war protest, it led to a switch in party control, first with the Democrats taking control of the House and Senate in 2006 and lead to the presidency of Barack Obama. In 2009, we saw a similar party shift begin to occur with the rise of the Tea Party movement, which was politically influenced and backed by the American Prosperity and the Koch brothers, which helped bring Republicans back into the office. Their message focused on the tea, or taxed enough already, spoke out against the bloated government and the rising debt. Their movement was translated into local politics, electing various Tea Party-backed candidates in the 2010 midterm elections. Occupy Wall Street followed in 2011, which sprouted from the Wisconsin labor protests in February of 2011 and the Arab Revolution in the Middle East. Occupy puffed up encampments across the U.S. and various cities. Their message reflected similar sentiments of the 1999 WTO protests, focusing on the growth of income inequality, the corruption of government and corporations, along with their collusion with one another. Attempts to demand a single message by the media led to the group break off in fractions. Their relevance brought back into the mainstream with, through the rise of Bernie Sanders in the 2016 election as he spoke their message of income inequality, the lack of regulation on corporations, and the continued depression of the labor force in the U.S. According to a study done by Harvard, messaging is what can make a protest successful or not. The report uses the example of the Tea Party, which worked within the framework of electing politicians that aligned with their views and how they were in fact very successful following the 2010 midterm elections that saw them gain seats in the House and Senate. It also should be noted that while a message is important, it's also important to note that the media attention that a certain protest can get. For example, groups like Black Lives Matter, environmental groups, and indigenous groups that made up the protests in the Dakota Access Pipeline protests get little attention or the wrong attention, and this is similar with the Occupy movement as well. Their message becomes caricatured with a few people that partake in property destruction or those not connected to the movement that partake in violent action. In these cases, everyone gets lumped together and the group's message is lost in the image of violence and clashes with the police that's repeatedly shown through media. Historically, any protest that clashes with the state and demands a restructuring of the establishment is going to be perceived negatively by those in power. And that's the thing. 
Protesting is just a singular action to a bigger movement that is created and built into an active organization that can participate within society and create change locally until it becomes a national calling. Protests are a way to bring local issues to national attention. Many saw the Dakota Access Pipeline on the most simplistic level as an environmental issue, which it is, but the ones leading the campaign were primarily Native Americans. It was made up of a collection of indigenous tribes that had constantly been pushed back throughout most of history. The people at the forefront of the XL Pipeline protests were farmers, ranchers, scientists, and Native tribes. All of these groups have either lived off the land or have been forgotten within our ever-growing globalized economy. The campaign for 15 an hour was a successful protest of fast food workers demanding a livable wage. The campaign started a new conversation on minimum wage, cost of living, and helped reframe the debate about minimum wage jobs. Economists joined into the conversation to question the market as we've seen an increase in productivity but little increase with wages. The campaign helped inspire cities to pass laws increasing their own minimum wages in attempts to provide a more livable wage for their citizens. Following the Sanders campaign, several new groups came out of the movement ready to take on politics and rebuild the Democratic Party through groups like Our Revolution, Justice Democrats, and we also saw the massive growth of the DSA, the Democrats of Socialist America. Women, minorities, and LGBT citizens have been jumping into local politics inspired by the attention of the Sanders campaign as we'll see the struggle within their local communities. Questioning the importance of protesting is essential. How do people, aside from voting, let their voices be heard? How can people speak out against acts of injustice? What is motivating people to take to the streets? A year later, after the Inauguration Day protests in 2017, we saw the first success within the Jade 20 trial, which saw the drops of all charges of the first six people to face trial. The J20 trial focuses around the event that happened last year during the inauguration protest, where nearly 200 people who attended the protest who were rounded up and all charged with up to 70 years in prison for citing to riot after they were in the same proximity of a few people that had done property damage. This is a victory for some of those who showed up to the January 20th protest last year to let their voices be heard, document the event, or just be a bystander that happened to be in the same proximity of a few who'd partook in property damage. Yet we stop to see what is the fate of those that are still waiting trial. The J20 trial highlights the imperative of protesting. It shows that protesting is effective and it worries those in power. They feel threatened by the power people in the bottom could have. The lack of media attention to the J20 trial shows the fragility and the threat that protesting can have. We need to demand our government's attention. With the lack of concern by the Trump administration and a majority of Republican and Democrats to their constituents' needs, we face many challenges ahead. But we also need to understand that as long as we can, we will continue to protest the injustices that affect us on a daily basis. We must understand that protests do not just come out of nowhere, that protesting are a people's response to a society that has failed on their promises to live up to the standard of democracy and justice for its people, and we should never submit with silence.